Okay, I'll call to order the March 28th special meeting of the Glendale City Council. Roll call, please. Councilmember Garpetian? Here. Najarian? Here. Sinanian? Here. Mayor Devine? Here. Next. The agenda for the March 28, 2017 special public meeting of the City Council was posted on Thursday, March 23rd, 2017 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. And what's the next item, please? One would be City Manager regarding legislative update. 1A, motion to note and file to legislative update. 1B, motion providing direction on the Commission on the Status of Women's Bills for Council's support. Thank you. Mr. Ochoa? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, we have a presentation both from our program supervisor, Christine Powers, as well as our uh, lobbyist in Sacramento, Mr. David Jones. Um, I will tell you by way of preamble to their presentations that it's uh, an exciting year, actually, by way of everything that's going on in uh, Sacramento to the extent that we have uh, opportunities for uh, perhaps some funding uh, for uh, some maintenance uh, uh, programs uh, and infrastructure ways, uh, but also by way of enhanced uh, land use authority and hoping to, as you'll hear in just a second, address issues of affordable housing, um, less by way of direct subsidy and direct funding from the state, but greater authority and latitude should these bills become laws, um, which then means that we need the city council and housing authority uh, to be prepared, uh, almost at the drop of a hat, as you'll hear from, from uh, Mr. Jones, to be able to make your way to Sacramento because the stakes will be that high this legislative session. So um, with that, um, without putting any undue pressure on these two <coughs> folks, let me have Christine come up and give you a very brief overview of the rather large, uh, uh, extensive platform that is in your staff report, and then we'll ask uh, Mr. Jones to give you a more of a drill down on some very key areas. Madam Mayor and Council Members, it has come to my attention there is another item on the list that we missed. It's 1C, it's 1C Motion to Support Assembly Bill 970, Frazier Vehicles Distracting Driving. Okay, thank you. We'll just have to put that as part of the motion on 1A when it gets time to have Council give us direction on that. Good afternoon, Mayor Devine, members of Council, Christine Powers with the City Manager's Office. So before you is the um, list of legislative bills that staff, um, along with David Jones, who's here today, uh, your state lobbyist, is tracking on behalf of Council based on our legislative platform. Uh, based on feedback from City Council, our state lobbyist, and the City's executive team, there are six areas that are um, emphasized in this report where Glendale's legislative priorities are most focused, and this includes housing and homelessness, transportation, public safety, energy, water, and redevelopment dissolution. The bills presented in this report are for the current legislative cycle, and while staff won't go through each of the hundred or so bills in this report, we would like to call to your attention a few of the bills. Uh, the big buy right bill that local municipalities are rallying against right now is SB 35. That is Senator Wiener's bill um, on planning and zoning affordable housing and approval. Uh, Glendale sent a letter of opposition to this on March 3rd. This would allow cities, um, you know, no authority as far as approvals on uh, certain types of projects. Uh, the one that is working against SB 35 and is essentially an answer to it is SB 540. That is Roth's bill on Workforce Housing Opportunity Zone. This is a league-sponsored bill. It's a means of planning for and streamlining housing approvals and construction, but it still allows cities to maintain a level of control over this process through an adopted specific plan. Um, I'm sorry, can you elaborate a little bit more on SB 35? Sure. SB 35 requires uh, project streamlining if regional housing needs assessment goals are not met at all income levels, and this applies to multi-unit developments and accessory dwellings. It requires development to occur at an infill site and also calls for projects to be built with prevailing wage, and it doesn't um, specify the amount of affordable units, and it also prohibits any parking requirements. So this In other is words, if, if there's a regional body that determines a need for housing, and that regional body would be who? Appointed. SCAG? Yeah. So SCAG determines, for example, that our region needs X amount of dwellings. And we have uh, zero say in it. That's it. They have to go up. We don't control parking space. We I, don't control... I haven't read that particular piece, but I would suspect it's based on whatever our arena number is, our mm -hmm. regional, regional housing needs assessment number is in our housing element. And, and what the legislation appears to be saying is that if 
you haven't hit that particular arena number for a particular time period, then you're going to be subject to the streamlining provision, which is you have to prove something uh, without the discretionary approvals that typically come with the, with the project uh, in Glendale, or at least with the more streamlined process. This is sort of a continuation of this process of state looking at the housing shortage that's in effect in California. And yes. the same way we saw the SCAGS, what is it, the SCAGS uh, mandate to have Glendale build, what is it, 6,000 units in downtown? Is that kind of an extension of what you saw from the ADUs governor last year. Yeah. Re recall that where the governor was saying, uh, and there was pushback from um, environmentalists, from labor associations, and from cities saying, you just can't take us out of the process. Um, but this is making that land use authority uh, for you based on some of these factors, which is why I think the league is coming up with this alternative of uh, 540 to say, well, you know, you control it. And it's interesting, um, perhaps uh, prophetic, that they're talking about these overlay zones, these workforce uh, housing zones, something similar to a concept that you all had talked about in the context of, of South Glendale Community Plan. If there is infrastructure, if there is amenity, if there is capacity, right. that you, the local officials, could create these zones and inside of these zones be able to facilitate development, which is a way of, of cities saying, look, we're not being obstructions. We're not saying no, but we have to be able to decide what's best for our community, as opposed to one size fits all from the state. And, and let me ask this. With the uh, mandate that we got for 6,000 units, we're at 4,000. Would they be able to come in and say, okay, you're 2,000 short and you need to make that up as soon as possible? The goal of, of the legislation is to, to require cities and perhaps all cities to uh, adopt a level of streamlining. So the short answer would be generally yes. Mm -hmm. I, think, so, I think the Madam Mayor is specifically asking with the impetus for the DSP that, you know, that this initial decision to authorize the, the building, the concept of building 6,000 units, and currently we're at 4,000. If this same line of thought, this same train of thought continues, are, is the state going to come back and say, by the way, you've only yeah. built 4,000? Where are the other two? Arguably, yes, and, and not just in the DSP area and infill sites around the community. So it could be on Foothill Boulevard, it could be on San Fernando Road, it could be on South Glendale. So your, your considered, as a body, your considered approach to uh, uh, concentrating development in the downtown really doesn't count anymore if this bill were to go forward because the, the push for streamlining would be applied at different infill sites around the, the community, which is why it, that's what makes it kind of dangerous from our perspective, but uh, from the, I think, the governor and, and his uh, staff, uh, from their perspective, certainly the, the author, is that, well, cities aren't acting fast enough. So Glendale has a great story to tell. We have done development. We've done a lot of housing, or affordable housing in particular, um, but not every city, not all 488 cities uh, have done that, or 455, whatever we're at now. Um, and, and so we don't get credit for that necessarily. They're still going to take the, the one-size-fits-all to basically all the cities in the state. Do, you, do we have any perspective or uh, as to how this is moving? Is this uh, this bill, SB 35, is it? SB 35. I can have Mr. Jones, who uh, actually does some uh, uh, work, uh, does the work for the league as well, to talk about both this and 540. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes. Um, couple of questions. It's, the biggest problem with SP35 was the funding, because this, after, at the end of the day, this was going to be affordable housing. And there were $400, $400 million for the entire state, so it was a joke. And that's why one of the biggest reasons it got turned down was that. And with the SP35, even if it went through, it didn't mean that you go around every single code that we have and build whatever you want. I think that's what I'm hearing from here, that uh, they could have just gone around the code and <coughs> built uh, buildings or units with no parking, and that's not the case. Am I correct? They still have to comply with our, our zoning codes. It prohibits us putting any sort of parking requirements, but I believe so it that's still is. Yeah. Answer. The answer is no. Yeah. The answer yeah. is no. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Of course. Sure. The, the key on SB 35 is it really is taking away your discretion. So if you have infill sites, if SB 35 were to be the law of the land, it's a buy right like the governor proposed. So you can't do design review. You can't do, they have to have a minimum amount of 10% uh, 10 or 10% in an infill site. 
that's the only amount of affordable housing they'd be required. And you would have to approve pretty much design review, no parking, all that discretion that you have that you cherish so much of local control of making Glendale the city that it is with high quality projects, that goes out the window with 35. So that's why 540 is so important because they are mutually exclusive. You can't have both these bills go into effect. So 540 that we'll talk about a little bit later, but is gives you the local control. It's, a, it's based on a planning ahead of time. So you do all the stuff ahead of time. You do your design review, your parking standards, your landscaping, whatever you want. And that gets done ahead of time. And that, that, that area that you've done a specific plan for, uh, that map has to last for five years. And if somebody knocks on your door and says, I, you've, we've passed SB 540, you've, you've adopted one of these zones, it's your choice to do it or not. If somebody comes in with a plan that meets your specifications, they get a very streamlined permit. Okay. So now, going back to uh, the, our downtown specific plan on 6,000 units, and how, do, how did we come up with that number? Was it because the, most of the, the residential neighborhoods were downzoned? Because that's what I heard. We're downzoning all the residential neighborhoods, so we don't develop in the, in the residential neighborhoods. We put everything in downtown. I mean, this is the first time that we hear about SCAG. I don't know, SCAG is the, uh, uh, basically a, a body that mandates the 6,000 units, or was this the state, or it was the housing element? No, I, I think we're confusing uh, different elements here, to, or different issues. To the extent SCAG is the regional planning authority that works with us to drive our arena numbers, I believe, yes? And so the arena numbers are over the entire city. My understanding, going back to 2006, is that the city council at that time felt that the portion of the arena numbers that could be accomplished in the southern portion of the city could be uh, met by upzoning the downtown and effectively flatlining or even downzoning in some places the uh, the surrounding neighborhoods. Now, recall from the downtown or from the from the uh, South Glendale Community Plan that a lot of that downzoning work, the heaviest of that downzoning, had actually, if I remember correctly, predated the, the uh, DSP. And so yes. really, so that all happens, I forget that, I wanna say the early 90s, um, I could be wrong, but it was the early 90s, and so to the extent that there is building development pressure in these neighborhoods, and the council recognizing that you wanna still attract development, but put it in a place where it makes the most sense, where there's the most amenities and access to transit, the downtown, the DSP area, right. became the focus. And, and another point is, unfortunately, this, the units that are being built did not help the housing crisis that we have. I mean, if you build 4,000 units, it had to help our housing crisis, but it didn't. So uh, I just want to put that out there that I don't care who imposed that 6,000 units on Glendale to put in downtown specific plan. The way they were designed and they were, they were built was only for numbers, the maximum number of unit. It did not accommodate uh, two bedrooms or three bedrooms in most of these developments, very small number, and it was not built for basically to, to ease off the housing crisis that we had in Glendale or shortage of housing that we had in Glendale. So it's not, I just want to put that out there. I, I think the, the issue of, of affordable housing in Southern California, in the L.A. area in particular, is a function of uh, a lot of cities. Are, it, it's interesting, as we've gone through our election cycle and, and you saw the, the March elections, L.A. and a number of cities in L.A. County had their elections as well. There were, you, you saw Measure S in Los Angeles actually defeated, but there were a number of other slow growth and no growth measures in the other March elections, um, which indicates that, that you see development, um, that, that a lot of development relative to the different communities all springing up in these different places. And so when we think of Glendale experiencing a lot of development, there are a lot of cities that are experiencing a lot of development. And I don't know that a lot of those cities in the wake of redevelopment dissolution were building a lot of affordable because uh, they were allowing the uh, private market to create uh, th those investments. When you look at that creation of new housing that is not affordable, as you point out, and you look at the evolution of the local economy where some folks have, have done very well and other folks in a lot of ways have been left behind because wages have stagnated, you know, I think you end up with the situation that we have today where there is not a lot of there's not a lot of housing that is affordable to those folks whose wages have indeed stagnated. They haven't kept up with where this new economy has gone. And so that affordable housing crisis, the, those old rules of, of ebb and flow, supply and demand really haven't caught up because the, the economy and, and the job market has changed so much juxtaposed to what it is that we built. Maybe 
in a previous generation, building more would have lent itself to a trickling through, not necessarily trickling down, but a trickling through of, uh, of affordability into laterally into the rest of the community. We're not necessarily seeing that right now because what we're ultimately seeing is a lot of folks who have owned properties in town sell those properties at very uh, at, at higher rates um, and at, at, with the new basis in land, those new landlords are jacking up rents on folks. Sure. And so the new housing wasn't for them. The old and housing is less and less for them, and they can't afford it because forces beyond your control are basically holding down wages. Right, and that's that's another issue because. Uh, there is no minimum or maximum a number of there is no uh, uh, density limit and they say if you can park it you can build it so that's why they squeeze everything in smaller units and only one parking and instead of building out 200 two bedroom units they built 390 one bedrooms and these one bedrooms are not uh, sufficient enough for families to live in and that's why it's not helping our, our, our it's not just affordability level it's the size of the units as well and of course when you pay $180,000 a door land value for a unit, of course it won't be affordable you know, to build something and rent. So. Which is why I think you get in, in the context of a bill that, that we want to frame up for you, um, this discussion of um, inclusionary housing on rentals, not just for sale, but on rentals. We think that could be very interesting and exciting for a city <coughs> like Glendale where there is investment um, and, and an opportunity to create affordable housing, true affordable housing, restricted affordable housing um, in a way that does not cost the state any, uh, any dollars, which at this point in time seems to be the name of the game on this particular front. Yeah, I think we have to be a little careful on that as well because most of the, the smaller developers who bought, purchased properties 20, 30 years ago and they're sitting on it to, to have enough money to build it think we're going to end up penalizing them with inclusionary housing when we let all these large developments go through and they have no inclusionary housing in there. I think we need to have a, we, we discuss this I think in the future, but we have to be very careful as to not to put that burden on a very small developer, developers because then it won't make sense for them to build at all. And that's where I think the council would be the, the group to actually make that policy decision. Does that apply evenly over all of the, the properties across Glendale that are, have an opportunity to turn or just those in corridors where it makes the most sense or if they are able to meet certain conditions by way of perhaps an extra, extraordinary development? You're willing to give, a, a, in some ways, a bonus, um, but the cost of that bonus is a greater affordability. But we'll, uh, let us get into that. I think that's, that's, a, that's a good segue maybe to talk about the, the – uh, I can't think of the author's name right now. Roth's bill, 540? Uh, no. Which one is that, David? Uh, Bloom. Bloom, the Bloom bill. But anyway, please. Um, so Mr. Jones gave you a little bit um, of an idea about SB 540. We have this on Hype Watch, so we're kind of watching it on high alert. The league is asking cities to support this bill. This would give developers some sense of certainty, since everything would be loaded on the front end and would let them know that, you know, Meeting all these requirements would allow them to have their permits in place within and approvals within 90 days. Um, so that's helpful for SB 540. Um, also, so just moving away from housing, uh, which David will get into in a little bit, for <coughs> council's consideration is a bill uh, recommended by the Commission on Status of Women is SB 169. It's Jackson's bill regarding sex equity in education and federal Title IX. It codifies the protections and requirements afforded by Title IX and provides clarifying guidance that all forms of student-on-student -student sexual violence are considered sexual harassment. So what this bill would do is by July 1, 2018, require that all public schools, including universities, comply with federal regulations that require schools to respond promptly and effectively to sexual violence that occurs against all students. And this is just in response to, you know, allegations against universities that aren't um, responding to and protecting uh, women on campus who are uh, sexually um, assaulted. Mm -hmm. And then finally for council consideration is AB 970. This is Fraser's bill that has to do with distracted driving. This was introduced on February 16th of this year and it enacts legislation to authorize technological solutions to prevent distracted driving. Um, this is being presented at the request of Council Member Najarian who asked for this at a 
um, earlier meeting this month. And the bill states that mobile telephone carriers shall provide customers with the ability to disable at the network level the distracting capabilities of their mobile phones when notified that the customer is driving a motor vehicle. So basically customers would contact their carrier to request activation to disable the distracting capabilities of their phone and request that full service be restored when they're no longer driving. So, uh, excuse me, this, this is simply a bill to um, encourage yes. uh, the research and of the technology. Correct? Yeah, yes. No, not funding it at all, just... just at this point, kind I, of my understanding is that it's just encouraging that the author is indicating that the techn technology is there, but that the carriers have to get involved, so this is what that bill is encouraging. So, I'm sorry, if they want to... If they're, if they're driving, they're disconnected, they have to call every time? No, you, they, can't, they can't talk on the phone. They no, I understand, but if, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you apply for it? Explain it one more time, please. It still hasn't been fully vetted out yet, but my understanding is that there's some feature on your phone that you say, I'm driving now, you know, hold, hold everything, and then without turning your phone off, and then once you're done driving, you press another button or it's somehow connected to your vehicle so it knows when you're driving and when you're not driving and then it so voluntarily you disconnect your phone or put it on some sort of a mode and then when you're not driving you say I'm not driving anymore it just yes. kicks back in okay it's voluntary yeah I don't think it is I don't think it is I don't think it's not voluntary for for the target audience which in this case would be Probably everybody, but especially teenage drivers, uh, distracted driving is a problem for everyone, especially young drivers. And so uh, my son is, uh, is 19 years old. Um, it, would, it could conceivably be programmed so when he gets into his car, puts the key in the ignition, uh, turns it, starts to go, at that point no text messages right. at all. Still receive a phone call because that's in the Bluetooth and it can go, go, but not the text messages. Doesn't lose the text message and uh, it'll just be stored. And then when he parks, turns off the, and removes the key from the ignition, they all come through. Right. Right. So that would be said that They said that the technology doesn't know if they're on a, a subway or a bus or, you know, what kind of transportation they're in and it'll just shut the phone off. And that's part of it. That has to be vetted out. Yes. yes. Given, given the fact that our... <clears throat> Uh, our city's built in such a way where a lot of people commute for hours, you know, for an hour or more to get to work. I mean, they try to use it productively, and sometimes they try to conduct business on the phone. If this technology is going to cut off their ability to be productive for such a long period of time during the day, I mean, I, I understand the safety aspect of it, but at the same time, the practicality of it. I don't think it goes that far. Okay. I think there's a connection to your vehicle that will indicate that you're actually in a vehicle, in vehicle and that right. you're the driver as opposed to the passenger. Yeah, right. But commuters and uh, transit users are not affected. Well, I mean, I mean drivers. I think too. the commuters, it could be a very tough sell uh, yeah. for folks. And they may, if, if, if this type of bill did get phased in, as an example, if the technology worked and the understanding with telecoms could work itself out, my guess is that they would try first and foremost with the most susceptible <coughs> population. Um, because if you tried to apply it over everybody, I, I could see a significant uprising of people saying, exactly. even though if they know it's not, it, it's not, it's bad for them to still answer that text when they're at a red light, they still want to be able to, to do it. But I think that part of the bill has to be, has to be flushed out. The technology has to be flushed out as well. well texts are, like, texts are, uh, you know, texts or private messages, those are a special case. No one should be looking at that and driving, period. But with Bluetooth technology and all that, it's a relatively, comparatively, comparatively safe activity to drive and be on the phone. I know there's plenty of studies out there saying that even through the Bluetooth, there's still a uh, safety issue there. But again, considering that we haven't provided our residents with any meaningful modern mass transportation, I mean countywide, right? We haven't. We're not, not nearly where we should be. Kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a... Harsh well, I, I, I think with all this manufacturers looking at driverless cars, the future that is going to, they're going to put it in every car in like five years or so, so um, you can put it on a self-driving mode and do what you got to do. That probably so. is closer than we all think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I think uh, we have to uh, kind of uh, support the bill just because it uh, has the potential, the potential to save lives, and, uh, and let's see where the technology takes us. Yeah, and I think in particular this bill um, requires
requires the cell phone companies to participate, the right. cell phone providers to provide in the uh, uh, development of the technology. So these issues that that we just talked about don't become a hindrance. Okay. And and you know what? It may this whole thing could be moot in five years, as uh, Councilman Garpichian says. Um, you know, technology is moving so fast, but um, this is just encouraging the cell phone uh, providers to cooperate and to help the development. Probably still won't stop the person that is going to go hands-free, but not really, because they won't have the phone up here, but they'll have it out here, right? It's not next to their head, and they think that's not going to get them the ticket, but indeed it will. <laughs> and it is at the customer's request, so I think it's to, that's what I was getting to, to help was people who can't request. help themselves. I think. And I'll have David come up at this time to kind of go in a little bit more in depth on some bills that he wants to bring to your attention as well. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Um, I'll do a quick rundown of kind of where we are in Sacramento. We're at the, uh, really the ramping up stage of the legislative process. Bills are pretty much introduced. February 17th is the deadline. They all wait to the end. They have to sit for 30 days. They can't move. And this week, they've really started uh, jamming. So um, we have about 2,500 bills introduced this session. So that's a little bit more than average. So we're, uh, an, and an awful lot of them are spot bills. Um, going through them, the vast majority of them, or the biggest topic, is housing and land use and affordable housing. About 180 of those bills deal indirectly or directly with land use or affordable housing. Uh, quickly, I'll give you kind of an overview, uh, and then I'll get to the major housing bills. Uh, governor's budget came out in January, um, and in an extraordinary move, he tried to rescind $1.5 billion of last year's spending. Uh, Extraordinary, he said, we've got, we're going to a recession. We don't know if the Trump administration is going to take Obamacare away. The state's got a lot of exposure to the federal government. So they're very, he's very concerned that he's going to leave the state with a deficit. So he's hyper-concerned about spending money, which you've kind of heard throughout this, this uh, presentation. Unfortunately, in that $1.5 billion was the million dollars for the Armenian Museum. So that was included in his list that he wants to take back. So the good news is the legislature is going through the beginning of the budget process, and when they've come to those items that he asked to, for them to give back, the legislature so far has said no. You spent the money, people made commitments, <clears throat> so we won't know until May on the million dollars for the Armenian Museum, but I think we're in pretty good shape as far as holding that. Uh, the big uh, pensions are once again going to be on the table. We'll have to have discussions about that. Uh, that's probably not going to happen until after the budget's done, so after June. Uh, but what is on the plate right now is transportation. So uh, for the last two years, the governor and legislative leaders have decried the infrastructure deficit. We haven't done our maintenance. Uh, the good news is it seems as if the votes are coming together. They need a two-thirds vote in both houses to do it. Uh, it's $6 billion a year for 10 years, so it's a pretty good amount of money to make a dent in the missing infrastructure stuff. Uh, for Glendale, the number remains at $6 billion per year. Our, uh, our revenue increase will be $6.8 million a year for the next 10 years. This and is by SB1 and AB1? SB1, right. right. So good news, we'll be watching for that in the next couple of weeks to see if that uh, comes to fruition. Uh, cap and trade program, I know Water and Power is interested in that. That's set to expire in 2020. Uh, it's very unclear. That also takes a two-thirds vote to keep continue. Uh, there's a lot of consternation amongst the environmental justice community of whether this is the best program. Polluters are allowed to buy tax credits and continue polluting, generally in downtrodden areas. Uh, so we don't know whether that program is going to continue. That's the main funding source for the governor's high-speed rail project. So high-speed rail hangs in the balance on cap and trade to see if that goes. Uh, another good news front is uh, park bonds. There's competing park bonds in both the Assembly and the, and the Senate. The uh, Assembly passed a park bond and sent it over to the uh, Senate thus last week. $3 billion for parks. About a billion of it is reserved for uh, maintenance and upkeep of existing parks. So I know we have a, a severe need for, for that kind of funding, so that's, that's good news. Uh, the marquee issue, as mentioned before, is housing. So I'll talk to you about a couple of the bigger housing bills, and then I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, 
uh, when we lost redevelopment, uh, that was $1.2 billion a year of affordable housing money, and that is exactly why we're in the situation we're in. Uh, when we met with the speaker a couple of weeks ago with another client, he said, you know, last year our top priority was affordable housing. We asked the governor for $1.5 billion in affordable housing money, and we got nothing. So last year's budget, the $400 million went away. They got nothing for affordable housing. So clearly this speaker and the legislature is clearly keyed and focused in on providing some real relief for affordable housing. So the good news is uh, we have a bill named, that's SB2, which is a bill that creates a document transfer fee. Uh, we chatted about this last year. It's supported by the realtors, uh, cities, and CAI. housing uh, advocates. We'll produce about $300 million a year for affordable housing on an ongoing basis, so that's very good news. We have asked Glendale for a return to source uh, amendment so that fees generated within Glendale would come back to, to Glendale. So far, we haven't gotten a yes on that, but we haven't gotten a no. So we'll, con we'll conti continue to work on that ask for, for Glendale and for others. Others have asked for that as well. Uh, SB3 is a $3 billion housing bond. Uh, we haven't done a housing bond in the state of California for over 10, 10 years. Uh, uh, doing a housing bond, uh, jump-starting $3 billion would be a very good shot of the arm for housing production, so that's also on good news on the good news front. Uh, Christine also mentioned SB 35. Uh, that is a, a very problematic streamlining bill. This was the governor's by-right proposal last year. I guess the good news is uh, it's still opposed by local governments, labor, and the environmental community. So, so far we have the trifecta of local control, labor and uh, and the environmentalists all complaining about the bill. Uh, the bill passed out of its first committee, is pending in Senate Governance and Finance. Uh, it has not been set yet, but it has to get out of this, that committee by the uh, 28th of April. So we'll be watching for that bill to be set. Uh, we represent the biggest cities in the chair's district, Santa Rosa, all the cities of Marin have all weighed in opposing the bill. So we're hopeful we'll have a good chance of holding SB 35 at bay and hopefully getting um, 540 to take its place. Does Glendale have a friend on the, the finance committee of any? <laughs> Governance and finance? <laughs> I, I don't think you do, oh, but I'll, oh. I'll double check. Yeah, okay. um, so we talked about uh, 548. I'll, I'll be happy to go back and revisit that if you'd like, but I'll mention a couple of other bills that were, um, were key to us. Uh, as as uh, Scott mentioned, uh, there's uh, AB 1506, which is by Bloom, and this repeals what's known as Costa Hawkins, which is uh, the uh, law that barred local governments from having rent control ordinances. So if this bill were to pass, then the city's would be free to adopt a rent control ordinance, and that may be of something of interest to you down the road. Very contentious bill, of course. There's a lot going to be a lot of controversy surrounding that. A uh, similar bill by the same author is AB 1505 by Bloom again. Uh, this, uh, this, there was a court decision called the Palmer decision, um, and that said you couldn't have inclusionary zoning on apartment complexes. So this bill will codify that and say, yes, you can if you choose. So that would be, again, for your discussion about inclusionary zoning, how to structure that so it helps. Uh, it's, it's good for the little guys as well. A uh, couple of other bills I'll, I'll mention, then I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, ACA 4 is a, bill, a constitutional amendment uh, that would uh, lower the threshold for housing bonds to 55%. So that's going to be a good one. And then we know that there's a bill that hasn't been born yet, another constitutional amendment that uh, the league is going to be sponsoring that would put before the voters a quarter cent for affordable housing, dedicated for affordable housing outside of Prop 98. Uh, what's exciting about it is redevelopment one, was roughly $1.2 billion a year. A quarter cent sales tax for affordable housing would be $1.6 billion. So it would be much more robust than we have with redevelopment. And uh, so that bill is going to be uh, uh, get a lot of attention. Lastly, I'll mention a couple things. Uh, ledge Action Days with the leagues is coming up on April 19th. I'd encourage you to think about participating there. Uh, these bills, and the, there's, uh, as Scott mentioned, there's an awful lot of activity in housing, and we would welcome your uh, engagement in the process in Sacramento. We're going to have, in fact, 540 is up next Tuesday, uh, so I'll be testifying on behalf of that bill for some other clients. But um, if you're interested in engaging in the process, we'd be happy to have you up there and, and think about Ledge Action Days on the, on the 19th, because housing, if you want to talk about affordable housing, that will be the, one of the key discussion that's items. That's next Tuesday? Uh, no, April 19th, 19th is Ledge Action, Action Days. Yeah. Next Tuesday is uh, 540 is heard in Governance and Finance. Can't make it next Tuesday for sure. No. Uh, questions? 
Yes, Mr. Yes, um, two weeks ago, I participated in SCAG's uh, legislative I trip. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so the biggest, one of the biggest issues we have in SCAG's region is uh, the cap and trade share, our fair share of the cap and trade, which uh, we're receiving about less than 20 percent, 19.6 percent of the entire amount. And uh, we are a much bigger region than Northern California. So my question to you is, what do you think is going to happen in 2020 when uh, we all told them that we will support the extension of the cap and trade if we get our fair share? And, but still it's up in the air. You know how it is. They always say, oh, well, we'll for sure you get your fair share. And then at the end of the day, things happen, right? So what do you think, what's the indication out there as to are we going to get at least a little bit more than what we got last go around. Well, I, 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 the cap and trade is is very much challenged, you know. And I, I think under this administration, you know, 60 percent of that stuff goes to high speed rail. So this governor is not going to change the allocation that's going to is the major funding for his high speed train. So I doubt that there's going to be much openness as far as reopening the 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 allocation, but. In Southern California, there's a lot of legislators from disadvantaged districts that are not happy with cap and trade going forward. They think that it really is uh, done terrible injustice to the disadvantaged communities, and they're, they want a different model. So cap and trade is truly a, a big question, a, on top of legal challenges. So the chamber's uh, lawsuit that says this was really a tax and it wasn't a fee, uh, that lawsuit is supposed to have been decided in the next couple of couple of months. So. It could get thrown out by the courts altogether, but I can't really tell you if they, uh, you know, how open they would be to really reopening cap and trade because it's everybody has their piece right now, so it's going to be a very difficult thing to reopen. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you. And Always April, good to be April nineteenth is the uh, the legislation action day. April nineteenth is ledge action days, and I would welcome to have you up and uh, happy to host you. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we have a uh, let's see, we need a motion for note and file, and uh, uh, you said we could take A and C, or can we take all three? One is a note and file, so what that I would one say will is be take by A and itself. B, and then in oh. A, Madam Mayor, put the. The direction to support um, uh, AB 970, since it, that way it's included within that, but it's not on the agenda, so we can't have a separate motion for that. So oh. moved. Second. Okay. Roll call. Council members Garpetian? Yes. Nujarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Devine? Yes. That's it. Okay. Next item, please. On this agenda, all we require is a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned.